Greetings all today. We're going to talk about the RNA world hypothesis and proto RNA, which is a new thing that they're working on because their RNA world hypothesis doesn't work. It, it doesn't hold any, uh, any weight or any water and it's pretty easy to disprove. So in order to get their RNA world hypothesis working, they have to get a replicating RNA cell to, to do something. Um, so what do they do? They manufacture their own RNA cell. So they can't get it to work in real life, so they built built a cell in the laboratory. And now that's going to be their, say, the way that they say it's done. Um, we're going to go back and, and look at, at this for a little bit here first. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, this is origin of life and abiogenesis, life from non-life. As much as you evolutionists out there would love to say that evolution is not abiogenesis. Oh, well, let's look. The RNA world hypothesis pr proposes that self-replicating ribonucleic acid molecules precursors to current life. Wouldn't that be evolution? Yes, it would be evolution. So shut your mouth with the abiogenesis and isn't evolution crap. It is. Um, so what they conclude here is, you know, the long story short is that RNA is way too fragile to work as any kind of a medium to self-replicate because pretty much everything wrecks it. Um, and this is the same thing as what you, you found out in the old Miller-Urey experiment in the 1950s. This is the one where they made amino acids by zapping some stuff in a system. And very much like anything else, it's, you know, it's, it's in a laboratory and they have their nice little collecting trap. So you, your spark zaps the stuff, your primitive atmosphere they have labeled. And then it goes around through here and then the amino acids collect here. And then the stuff comes back up to get zapped again. And if this little trap wasn't here, all your imi amino acids would be zapped dead. Yeah, that's like real life. And the same thing happens with your RNA, because your RNA is really fragile. Now, what the RNA does is, uh, I think over here we got the DNA, right? Well, the RNA copies information from the DNA and goes off and goes and works with it. And it unzips the DNA and zips it back up, depending on what, what it's doing. The RNA only has one strand. It doesn't have two, um, which makes reproduction kind of a problem there, right? Because when you reproduce, you're unzipping the DNA and combining with something else's DNA, whether it be a person or a plant or whatever. And that's how reproduction works, and that's where you get variation. Well, if you only got one strand, eh, you really can't reproduce much other than make a copy of yourself. So you're not really going to get very far copying yourself over and over and over again, except dead from genetic mutation. That's just how it works. Um, so RNA is a lot simpler than DNA. So they figure, and it does lots of stuff. So they think, yeah, well, a long time ago, sure, RNA built itself out of whatever was floating around out there. And yeah, it, it doesn't have much weight to it. And they've kind of given up on it. So they come up with a way to make it work by having their protocell. Um, and this is a simpler form of RNA, yet simpler, yet simpler, yet simpler. They have to go in order to start with something. Um, so they got their protocell and they actually get it to self-replicate. And I will say that, you know, what they did was they, uh, got a bunch of cells together and, and they kind of clumped together because RNA likes to do that. I'm not sure why, what's the deal with that. But then to get them to replicate, they shook the thing. They shook the little beaker that they're in and they all fell apart and they called that replication. Eh, whatever. It's not all that important. Um, but what I do want to point out here is that a working version of a complete protocell has not yet been achieved in a laboratory setting. So as much as people want to link this crap to me about, you know, how life is going to start from nothing, you still ain't got nothing. Nothing. Um, and you know, we'll go back to giving the pen credit for writing war and peace. The reason that the RNA world doesn't work is because you ain't got no information. The DNA, the building blocks there, the, the blueprint, not the building blocks. That's the amino acids, the blueprints. You ain't got no blueprints. So how are you going to build something with no blueprints? You can't, you know, the RNA is, is, is the worker bee. The RNA is the million union members out there waiting to build a building. 
and the DNA is the union contract that tells them they're going to get paid for it and what they're supposed to do. And without that union contract, those union labors ain't going to do nothing. So that's your proto-cell for you. Um, let's see what else they say. Other problems need to be solved, such as the fact citrate is not a plausible prebiotic component. Really? And you know, I get linked the E. coli experiment about them sitting in citrate, and I say that it's pretty garbage experiment to say that that is evolution when they're sitting in citrate in a food-rich environment. Um, so yeah, you put them out there in what, what do they think the original atmosphere was like ammonia or something? I mean, your RNA ain't going to last very long. Um, so they say it needs to be replaced by an alternate, con alternate component. Finally, at a certain level of complexity, a third main component of the cell would be helpful. Chemical energy metabolism. Okay. Nevertheless, conceptually and practically, the Stozvak protocell is the closest approximation so far to the origin of life forms which have a potential to evolve. Now, again, I'm going to point out that abiogenesis is not supposed to have anything to do at all with evolution. But every article that I go to on the origins of life, it's pointing to evolving. Now, this is good research. I like this stuff. You know, it's important stuff. But... Why is the only thing we can do in genetics trying to prove that we're a bunch of monkeys running around? Can't we, like, cure cancer? Can't we use this stuff to cure cancer? Do we have to say, you know, you try to look at every possible way we can to say that God doesn't exist? Can't we use protocells for cancer? Wouldn't that be more worthwhile? Huh? Just, you know, I'm throwing it out there. Now, the problems with this experiment, much like the, the Yuri Miller thing, is the environment. You're building this crap in a laboratory. And, you know, I don't really care so much about building something in a laboratory. I know for a fact science will never be able to build life, in a, even in a laboratory, without using pre-existing life. It can't happen. Um, so I don't care what you use. But creating something in a laboratory is a far, far, far cry from pre, pre, my primordial Earth. Whatever they say in the textbooks, we're all have emerged from a puddle of goo and then a frog jumped out or something, and that's responsible for all the trees, all the, all the, all the animals, all the insects, all the birds. B.S. Okay, B.S. I don't know the last time I went walking through the woods and I saw a frickin' test tube and a beaker and a power supply. Uh, I don't, I don't, no. I never saw a beaker of citrate with bacteria floating in it. So... We'll put that out there. I mean, I don't care what they use. They're never going to create life. But um, this is fairly new research. There isn't a whole lot of articles. But I, I did check uh, Institute for Creation Research on it. And they say it's on the verge of a dead end. And I'm, I'm kind of in that camp there. I mean, I think it's kind of, kind of neat stuff. But the crux of their argument is that you look at... Uh, all the things that they take by assumptions and all the things that they, they didn't do anything with primordial earth. They just went to go see if they could do it. And then they're proclaiming, aha, this is how it was done way back in, you know, billions of years ago. Well, we'll look at what they're doing here. If neo-Darwinian Neo-Darwin evolution, which is supposed to involve nature selecting whole organisms from within a population, applies to raw chemicals, and if the first cell membrane was not made of uh, phospholipids, uh, like all modern living cells, but instead with fatty acids, and if there was a nutrient-filled ocean on, on an early Earth, and if those nutrients contain just the right precursor chemicals, and if those nutrients were optically purified, which science shows cannot happen without machines, and if those precursors could eventually morph into chemicals of real life, DNA, RNA, proteins, vitamins, cholesterols, and certain carbohydrates, although chemistry has shown this is not possible without machines, and... If those nutrients were highly concentrated in a small area, despite forces that would lead to their diffusion, and if fatty acids could spontaneously generate in a watery soup, this is a good one here because this is what I go to. The common sense thing is you look at all the things they're using and you go, where are you getting fatty acids from in the primordial soup? Where, where, is, where do these come from? Uh, we'll move on. If the nutrient concentration coincided with floaty fatty acids in a bubble, and if the ocean had a proper pH required to form vestigials, bubbles assembled from fatty acids to serve as containers for the new cells, 
and if the temperature in the ocean fluctuated precisely to disrupt the bubble's integrity, permitting nutrients into but not out of itself, and if oxygen, free radicals, and other harm harmful chemicals, ultraviolet light, electricity, or any physical motions were not there to disrupt the, uh, disrupt the delicate concoction, and if the high temperature required to introduce the bubble assimilate small iron out like bits, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I'm tired of reading this. Anyways, your, your big ones are they're, they're taking all these components for granted. And you got to create all these components to create your protocell before you can say, this is how life formed. You know, you can't just start with RNA. You can't just say, oh, yeah, the, the information in the RNA module is, is already was already there. The R RNA needs programming. And I'm going to guarantee you, you look into this, uh, their protocell here, this little bit of stuff in here, they had to get from somewhere. Now, get me to this little bit of stuff from nothing. This is nothing. This is nothing new. Um, you, you, you don't get information from nowhere. It doesn't just spontaneously combine. Uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, what they did was they built a cell, an RNA cell, that did what they wanted it to do. Uh, well, actually, no, they didn't, because down here they says they never actually got a working version working or going. But their RNA model didn't work, so they built a different type of RNA. I don't know what they used for the little bit of stuff in here, the, the information. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a man-made blob of something that still doesn't prove their uh, hypothesis. So this essentially has become is a non-story. Um, this is the first that I've really actually heard about it. Um, it is brand new, though, so I'm sure that from now on, everything you're going to hear for the next year is going to be about protocells, you know, proving, the, proving that you're a monkey uh, crawling out of a pit of water four billion years ago. Um, but it's not. It's Yuri Miller of the uh, 21st century. That's what it is. And with that, 